All right, we had one more thing to cover in section 9.2, and that's called the divergence theorem. It says, it's stated in two different ways. If the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n converges, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n has to be the number zero. Or, it's also stated this way, and this is the way we'll usually use it, if the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is not equal to zero, then the sum from n equals one to infinity of a sub n diverges. And that's the way we'll normally use it. We'll normally use it to prove that series diverge, because it doesn't really help you prove the series converge. <coughs> okay, so for your homework, the big part of the homework in this section, you're going to be given series, and the question to you will be, does it converge or does it diverge? So we had the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 3 to the n over 1,000. And the question is, does it converge or does it diverge? 50-50 chance of being right. Diverge. Diverge. Why do you say diverge? <coughs> because um, as n goes to infinity, the top's going to get really, really big and the bottom's going to stay the same. All right. I think there are two correct answers. Number one, the limit as n goes to infinity of 3 to the n over 1,000 is infinity, which is not equal to 0. Why is it important that that's not equal to 0? Because then we can use the divergence theorem. Because then we can use the divergence theorem. If this limit is not equal to 0, what does it tell you about the series? It diverges. So there's one correct answer. One correct answer with that problem is you can use the divergence theorem. The di divergence theorem shows that it diverges. Anybody got another correct answer? What if I were to write it this way? The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 1,000 times 3 to the n. What kind of series is that? We only know two kinds. The only kinds we know are geometric and telescoping. Geometric. That one's geometric. Why is it geometric? It's, uh, part of the it's got a base, three, raised to a power. This is geometric. And when do geometric series converge? When R is between negative one and one. When R is between negative one and one. And R, in this case, R is three. So another answer would be geometric r equals 3, so it's divergent. So you can convince me two different ways that that series is divergent. Okay, how about the sum? From n equals 1 to infinity of 4n plus 1 over 3n plus 9. Converges or diverges? chance of being right. Of course, the next question is going to be why. So. Diverges. Diverges. How come? Because it's, if you took the limit of it, you <coughs> think the limit is 4 over 3. I agree completely. Again, I think you use the divergence theorem here. If I take the limit as n goes to infinity, a 4n plus 1 over 3n plus 9, I get 4 thirds, which is not 0. So, uh, in general, 
When I ask you, does a series converge or does a series diverge, that's probably the first thing you want to check. You probably want to check that limit. If that limit is not the number zero, then you're done. Your answer is divergent. So that's probably the first thing I would always check. Because usually you can just do that limit right in your head. You can see right away if that limit is zero or not. What if that limit is zero? No. It might converge. It might converge. Notice that this series, this statement says it the other way. If you know the series converges, then the limit is zero. It doesn't say if the limit is zero, then it converges. In fact, <laughs> before the end of the day, we will see an example of where this limit is zero, but this series does not converge. So if this limit is zero, it really doesn't tell you anything. It tells you it might converge, it might diverge. We don't know. This is only useful when this limit is not the number zero. When this limit is not the number zero, then you know you're, it's divergent and you're done. So if, if the summation is divergent, does that mean you can never get an answer? Right, because what's happening here for this one, when n gets really, really big, each term is getting close to four-thirds. So eventually you're adding four-thirds plus four-thirds plus four-thirds plus four-thirds or something really, really close to it. What happens when you take four-thirds plus four-thirds plus four-thirds? It keeps getting bigger and bigger and getting closer to infinity. That's right. And the same thing happens with this one. When n gets big, three to the n gets to be really big. So you're adding bigger and bigger and bigger numbers together. It gets closer to infinity. So usually that's what diverge means. Diverge usually means um, is adding up, getting closer and closer to infinity. But it doesn't always have to be that. Let me give you an example of one that doesn't get closer and closer to infinity. What if I were to give you the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n? What's happening there? It's bouncing back and forth between positive and negative. So what's happening to the <coughs> partial sums? S sub 0 would be negative 1 to the 0, which is 1. S sub 1 would be 1 plus negative 1 to the 1, which would be 0. S sub 2 would be 0 plus 1, negative 1 squared, which would be 1. S sub 3 would be 1 plus negative 1 cubed, which would be 0. So are the partial sums getting close to a number? No, the partial sums are bouncing back and forth between 1 and 0, 1 and 0, 1 and 0. So is that summation getting closer and closer to a single number? No, so we would consider that divergent also. This one's also divergent. Usually when they diverge, it means they're adding up to infinity or negative infinity. But it doesn't have to be. It could be uh, a series that does something like that, bounces back and forth between two numbers, and so it's not getting close to any one number. <coughs> All right, let's grab a few more out of the book here. How about the sum from n equals 1 to infinity? 1 over n plus 1 minus 1 over n plus 2. Converges or diverges? Well, again, the first thing I would probably check, I would check the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n plus 1 minus 1 over n plus 2. And that limit is? Zero. Zero minus zero, which is zero. So unfortunately, the divergence theorem fails. The divergence theorem doesn't give me any information. This series might converge. It might diverge. So I have to do something else. Good ideas? Is it a telescoping? I think this is a telescoping one. 
Try plugging in a few numbers and see what happens, and I think you'll find that this is telescoping. For example, if I plug in 1, I get 1 half minus 1 third. Plus, what do I get when I plug in 2? One third minus one fourth. And when I plug in three, one fourth minus one fifth. That's enough to convince me that's telescoping. So not only does it converge, it converges to that one, converges to one half. <coughs> because this one's one half, what's going to happen to all these other terms? They're going to get closer and closer. Well, they're going to keep canceling out until you get to the last one, but the last one's going to keep getting closer and closer to zero. This last one will get smaller and smaller. The next one will be one fifth minus one sixth, one sixth minus one seventh, so on and so forth. That's a convergent telescoping series. Converges to one half. So you might remember yesterday I told you. Uh, how are you going to recognize when you have telescoping series? It's usually ones where you can do partial fractions on. Well, they tried to make this one easy for you. They already did the partial fractions for you. So they already gave you the partial fraction decomposition. So that one should have looked like telescoping right away. The sum from n equals 0 to infinity. 5 over 3 to the n. Converges or diverges? Converges. Converges, why? Because um, the ratio is 1 third. It's geometric. I can, I'm going to rewrite this. This is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 5 times 1 third to the n. That's geometric. R is one third. So it converges. And we can do even better since it's geometric. We can say exactly what it converges to. What was our rule for finding the convergence of a geometric series? A over one minus R. In this case, A is the number five. One minus R is the number one third. So that's 5 over 2 thirds. That's 15 halves. So that one's geometric, converges to 15 halves. Questions on that one? All right. The sum from n equals 1 to infinity. Ln of 1 over n. Converges or diverges? Diverges, how come? Not 1. No, but you're on the right track. So what you're looking at is you're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of ln of 1 over n. When n gets really, really big, 1 over n gets really, really close to 0. What's ln of something really, really close to 0? Negative infinity. Remember, your ln graph has a vertical asymptote at 0. Looks like so. So when your x's, in this case your 1 over n's, are getting closer and closer to 0, your y values get closer and closer to negative infinity. And negative infinity is not the number 0. So it's divergent by the divergent theorem. So in this case, when you add up all the numbers, you're getting closer and closer to negative infinity. So this one diverges, getting closer and closer to negative infinity. How about, last one, I suppose, the sum, n equals 0 to infinity of e to the negative n.
converges or diverges? Diverges, why? When I take the limit, it doesn't equal zero. So if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the negative n, what do I get? I get zero? He said I don't get zero. Why do you say you get zero? Forget why I plugged it. It was a problem on the <laughs> homework last night. How if I were to write it this way? 1 over e to the n. A negative exponent simply drops that thing down to the bottom. Now when n gets really, really big, e to the n gets really, really big. 1 over really, really big is close to 0. I didn't realize it was a negative n. Oh, you didn't realize it was a negative n. OK. Unfortunately, that doesn't do me any good. When I get that limit equals 0, that doesn't tell me anything. It tells me it might converge, it might diverge. But I already knew that. I already knew it might converge, it might diverge. I really want that answer to not be zero. It's not. So the question is still out there. Converging or diverging? Can we turn it into a geometric? I think we can. This is a sum from n equals zero to infinity of one over e to the n. That negative exponent drops the e down to the bottom. So I agree with you that is geometric. So is it a convergent geometric or a divergent geometric? Divergent. Divergent, why? No, it's convergent. Convergent, he changed his mind. Why did you change your mind to convergent? Because E is greater than one that's on the bottom. E is about 2.7 something. So one over E is between negative one and positive one. This is convergent geometric. Negative one is one over e is between negative one and one. What's a convergent geometric? Not only that, what does it converge to? What's a? One over one minus R. 1 minus 1 over E. So that's what it converges to. Questions on that one? All right, section 9.3. integral test and P series. The integral test says suppose f of x is positive and eventually always decreasing. What do I mean by eventually always decreasing? At some point it will reach a point where it is no longer doing anything other than decreasing. At some point it reaches, a, it reaches a maximum and after that maximum it's always decreasing from there on forever. So it might not be decreasing all the time, but eventually maybe for x bigger than 10, the function is decreasing always for x bigger than 10. That's what you need. You need it to be eventually be decreasing. Uh, suppose further that f at n equals a sub n. What does that symbol mean? F at n equals a sub n. What's n?
Well, what do we use a sub m for? Series. Series. So these are terms of the series. So what I'm saying is if I take a sub 3, that's the same as f at 3. Or if I take a sub 100, that's the same as f at 100. And it's just a natural number. Then, both the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx and the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n converge or both diverge. Questions on that? Okay, so these are going to look like this. The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. Is that series geometric? No, it's not geometric. Why not? The n is in an exponent. The n is not in an exponent. To be geometric, n has to be in an exponent. So if it, was, if it were 1 over 2 to the n, that would be geometric. This one's not geometric. Is it telescoping? I can't well, but the only way I can factor it is 1 over n times 1 over n. So I don't think partial fractions is going to work. So I don't think it's telescoping either. So the question is, does it converge or diverge? Well, if I'm looking to see if it converges or diverges, Again, the first thing I do is I use that divergence test. And right away, uh, I can do that in my head. I wouldn't expect you to show that on the paper. Um, right away, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n squared is 0. So that doesn't help. So what we're <coughs> going to do is we're going to try the integral test. So we're going to consider the function f of x equals 1 over x squared. Is that function positive? No matter what number I plug in for x, do I get a positive number? Yeah, that function is positive. Is that function eventually decreasing? Yes, I'll come. Yes, not only eventually decreasing, it's always decreasing, isn't it? Because when x gets bigger, you're dividing by a bigger number. When you divide by a bigger number, the fraction gets so it's definitely decreasing. So what that tells me is I can take a look at this integral. The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. And according to the integral test, if that integral converges, then the series will converge. Conversely, if that integral diverges, the series also diverges. So the integral and the series do the same thing, in other words. Does that integral converge or diverge? Converge. How come? Mm, I don't think it gets closer to zero. I don't think that integral is zero. No, I don't think it's closer to negative one either. You can't get close to negative 1. It's always positive. It's got to get close to a positive number at worst. All right, well, in proper integrals, we take the limit as b goes to infinity. The integral from 1 to b of 1 over x squared dx. That's the limit as b goes to infinity. 
What's the antiderivative of 1 over x squared? Think of that as being x to the negative 2. So it's negative 1, x to the negative 1. Plug in our numbers. What happens when you plug in b and then you take the limit as b goes to infinity? It's zero because think of this x to the negative one as being one over x. You've got x on bottom, which means you're going to have b on bottom. When b gets bigger and bigger, the fraction gets smaller and smaller. So that's zero. Minus what happens when I plug in one? Negative one. So that's one. So does that integral converge or diverge? Converge. I got a number, didn't I? By converge, we mean we got a number. We didn't get infinity. Does that integral converge or diverge? It converges. Since the integral converges, what can you tell me about the series? Converges as well. It converges as well. What does it converge to? No. Unfortunately, the integral test doesn't say that. The integral test does not say they converge to the same thing, unfortunately. So the best we can say at this point is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared converges by the integral test. Unfortunately, the integral test does not tell us what it converges to. The integral and the series do not converge to the same number, unfortunately. In fact, this happens to be a very famous series. I believe this one converges to pi squared over 6. But the integral test doesn't tell us that. The integral test just tells us it does converge. Questions on that one? Because it converges to pi squared over 6. I don't know why it's famous. It just is. How does the pi get introduced to that? Uh, that's a wonderful question. And I don't know the answer to it off the top of my head. I would have to look it up. I, don't, I have no idea how pi squared over 6 comes out of that. Is the proof for the integral test real long and complicated? Like why is it that that works? Why is it that that works? Um, the proof is in your book. I'm not going to go through it. The, the basic idea is here's your function f of x. What does the integral tell you? The area. So the integral, remember how we did area? We built rectangles and such. The integral tells you the area. Of course, this is going to infinity. So the integral tells us the area of that whole shape. But what we're looking at is we're looking at only the series. So the series means I plug in 1 and I get a spot. I plug in 2 and I get a spot. I plug in 3, I get a spot. I plug in 4, 5, 6, so on and so forth. So what you can think of is the series is kind of if you think of just a, a teeny tiny little rectangle, so you've got one rectangle there, you've got one teeny tiny rectangle there, so on and so forth. Well, if the whole area adds up to a number, then it would make sense that these teeny tiny little rectangles are also going to add up to a number. So that's the basic idea behind the proof. If you want to read it, it's in your book. I don't think the proof is important for what you need to do. Okay, how about the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. You know what? I think there's one more rule here for the integral test. Your function also has to be continuous, and I don't think I wrote that down. Suppose f of x is positive, continuous and eventually decreasing. But that's re not really an issue for us because all the functions we're going to look at are continuous anyway. So. All right, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n converges or diverges? Well, what does the divergence theorem tell you? What if you take the limit as n goes to infinity? 
So the divergence theorem tells you? Nope. No. Tells you nothing. The divergence theorem only tells you something when you don't get zero. If you do get zero, the divergence theorem tells you nothing. Divergence theorem fails. Doesn't tell you anything. So far, every example we've seen when that limit is zero, the series has converged. Here's an example where that doesn't happen. The series is going to diverge. Because we're going to use the integral test. We're going to let f of x equal 1 over x. Is f of x equals 1 over x a continuous function? Yes. Is it a decreasing function? Yes. Well, how come? Going to get bigger and bigger? Is that function always continuous? No, it's not continuous at zero. zero, but we don't care. Why not? Because we're starting at one. Okay, so this function is continuous for x bigger than or equal to one. It's decreasing. Is it positive? Again, if you're dealing with positive numbers, which we are, it is positive. All right, so this is continuous, decreasing, positive. It meets all the criteria. We take the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. That's the limit as b goes to infinity. The integral from 1 to b of 1 over x dx. That's the limit as b goes to infinity. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x dx? ln absolute value of x. From one to b. We have to show that limit step there. Of course, you got to show that limit step there. So I plug in b and I let b go to infinity. What do I get? When b gets really, really big, what happens to ln? It gets really, really big too. So this limit is infinity. And then I plug in 1. When I plug in 1, the ln of 1 is 0. So I get infinity minus 0. That's infinity. So the integral is divergent. So what does that tell you about the series? It's also divergent. The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n is divergent by the integral test. All right, so this is a famous series also. This is a famous series for two reasons. One, it's almost always the first example of where this limit is zero, but the series is divergent. For every other series we've seen, when that limit was the number zero, they always converged. So it's famous for that. It's also, also famous because it has a name. This is called the harmonic series. Anybody know why it's called the harmonic series? What happens when you take a length of string and you hold it tight and you pluck it? It vibrates and you get a sound, right? What happens if you take that same string, you cut it in half, and pluck it again. What's that? Sounds different. How? How much higher? It would be exactly one octave higher. What happens if you take that same string, cut it in thirds, and pluck it again? If the original note was a middle C, when you cut it in thirds, it's going to be the C two octaves higher. What happens if you take that same string and cut it into a quarter and pluck it? Then it goes three octaves higher. So that's why it's called the harmonic series. These numbers that you get, one half, one third, one fourth, create what are known as harmonies in music. So this is called the harmonic series. So that's why it's famous, for two reasons. All right, P series.
the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the p converges if p is greater than 1 diverges if p is less than or equal to 1. So these two series that we've just looked at using the integral test, these are special cases of series called p-series. So this is a p-series, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. What's p in this case? One. p is the number 1, n to the 1. And we saw that this series diverged. Conversely, this series, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared, that's also a p-series. It's a p-series with p equals 2, and it converged. So why did this one converge and the other one diverged? What's special about this exponent here being bigger than 1? It makes it get really small really quick. That's true. It keeps all the values positive. Well, the values are all going to be positive anyway because I'm only plugging in positive numbers. Is 1 over n to the 1 is ln, and above it will still be fraction. If your power is bigger than 1, what's going to happen when you integrate? If this power is n to the 1.1, what happens when you integrate 1 over x to the 1.1? 1, 1. 1 over x to the 0. 0. You add 1 to your power, you're still going to have a negative number, aren't you? Which is still going to push this x down to the bottom. Okay? So the basic idea is if I have the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the 1.1, when I integrate that, that's x to the negative 1.1. When I integrate that, I add 1 to my power. And then what's going to happen when I take a bigger and bigger and bigger number and plug it in? What happens when x gets really, really big there? Because this has a negative power still, when x gets really, really big, this is going to get really, really close to 0. So it will make that integral converge. What if this power that I started with was less than 1, though? What if I had the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the 0.9? then when you add one of that power, you're going to have x to the point 0.1 divided by point 0.1. And then what's going to happen when x gets really, really big? It's going to be diverge. It's going to be infinity. Okay. So at this point in our life, we can now talk about three different kinds of series. What are the three kinds of series we know? Geometric, telescoping, and P-series. Those are the three kind of series we know. Alright, let me pick one more problem out of the book here. How about... The sum! I didn't see one in the book that I liked, so I'm just going to make one up. The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n times ln. Is that geometric? No, because it doesn't have r to a power. Is it telescoping? Can you factor the bottom and do partial fractions? No, so it's not telescoping. Is it a P-series? No, because P-series have just n to a power. P-series don't have LNs in them. 
So it doesn't fit any of our three patterns. So then we have two choices for determining if it converges or diverges. What are our two choices? What are our two theorems that we know at this point? Divergence. The divergence theorem and the integral test. I always start with the divergence theorem because it's the easiest one. What's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n ln n? Zero. Zero. So crap, the divergence theorem doesn't tell me anything. The divergence theorem only helps when that number is not zero. So I guess at this point my only option is trying to use the integral test. So I need to look at the function f of x equals 1 over n, oops, I'm sorry, 1 over x ln x. And at this point, I see the teacher made a mistake by just making up this problem. Uh, anybody tell me what the mistake is? Is that function positive? Yeah, yeah okay. Is it continuous? No, where is it not continuous? <laughs> One and zero. zero. So what's the mistake the teacher made? Yeah, I can't start at n equals one, can I? I better start at n equals two. I can't start at n equals one because I would have undefined for my very first term when I try to plug one in. All right, so let's ask the question again. Is that function continuous? Yes, yes because I'm only using numbers two and bigger. Is that function positive? Yes, why? True. Ln is always positive. It's positive for interval. It's positive in my interval. Ln is always positive as long as you're using numbers that are bigger than 1. Ln of 1 is 0. Ln of a half is a negative number. So is it positive? Yes, because I'm using numbers 2 and bigger. Is it decreasing? Yes, how do you know it's decreasing? The bottom is always getting bigger. What if, doesn't happen on this problem, but what if there were x's on top and x's on bottom? How would you convince me that it's decreasing? Power on bottom is greater than the power on top. Mm, but that doesn't mean it's always decreasing, though. Lopitals? No, not lopitals, but you're getting closer. How did we show things were decreasing in Calc 1? We took the derivative and we showed that the derivative was negative. So for some problems, you might actually have to take the derivative and convince me that the derivative is a negative number. I don't think you have to do that here because it's clear that when, the, when x gets bigger, the bottom gets bigger, the top doesn't change. So it meets all the criteria. So we need to take the integral from one from two to infinity of one over x ln x dx. That's the limit as b goes to infinity. Integral from two to b of one over x ln x dx. That's the limit as b goes to infinity. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x ln x? Ln, 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 ln of x. ln of ln of x. Excellent. How'd you get that? U sub. U sub, you let u be ln x. ln x, and then du is 1 over x dx. So this becomes the integral of 1 over u du. And the integral of 1 over u is? ln u, but then I plug my u back in, I get ln of ln of x. Evaluated at 2 and b. Okay, so I plug b in. And then I let b get bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens if I plug b in and I let b get bigger and bigger and bigger? I get infinity because ln of a number getting bigger and bigger and bigger is infinity and then ln of infinity is still infinity. I get infinity minus ln of ln of 2 which is infinity. So by the integral test that integral diverges so what can you tell me about the series? 
it diverges. Questions on that? All right, my last couple questions of the day. The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n cubed. Converge or diverge? Converge. converge. She says without confidence. Why does it converge? This is a P-series. P equals 3 greater than 1. Convergent. Okay, how about the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 3 to the n? Geometric. That's the same as the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 third to the n. So geometric, is it convergent or divergent? Convergent, convergent because r is 1 third, which is between negative 1 and positive 1. That's convergent. All right, so these are how these things are going to go. You need to start being able to look at a series, tell its type, and tell me if it converges or diverges. How about this one? The sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the 1 half. Divergent. Divergent because? P series. Divergent P series. B equals a half, which is less than 1. That's right. Questions on any of those? the integral test, we said that it has to be always positive and decreasing. Could you also have that test work if it was always negative and increasing? Would it work if it were always negative and increasing? That's a good question. Um, I think so would make sense that it would work because it, it, in the sense if it's always negative and increasing uh, you're just getting the area underneath the axis mm -hmm. but it's always going the right direction so it, I yes I do think that would work All right. although I've never seen that written down anywhere in a book okay. usually when we're dealing with infinite series we're dealing with positive numbers um, we will deal uh, later in the section we'll deal with something that we call alternating series where they go positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. We'll talk about convergence and divergence. But it's, it's pretty rare that you see a summation where, where it's all negative numbers. Could happen, though. Is there a way to solve P-series that we know? Is there a way to find their value? Unfortunately, no. Is that, like, right now, or...? Uh, we will not do that in this class. Finding the exact value of certain P-series that would be covered in a junior, senior level uh, introduction to analysis type course, usually. So now we won't, all, all we will say about P-series is it equals a number. I don't know which number, but it equals some number. <laughs> so it's kind of weird in a sense when you're dealing with series. Your answer is it converges, but you don't know what the answer really is. It's a little hard to get used to. Other questions?